Bibles, we're going to look at uh, the first of two readings. And this reading is from James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And the key verse that we're going to be looking at is contained in this reading. It's only a short one. We're going to be reading verses 16 to 19. I suppose the nice thing about Zoom is you can uh, see everybody focusing and you know that when heads are coming up that everyone's everyone's ready. Um, but a familiar passage, hopefully, to us all. James looks at an awful lot of practical ways that we conduct ourselves as Christians. And that's one of the things we're going to be looking at uh, in some of the thoughts we'll be sharing today. So James chapter 5, I'll be reading verses 16 to uh, 16 to, to 19. And he says this, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. And sorry, it should have been to 18, not 19. So there we go, 16 to 18. And the key verse is the second part of verse 16. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Amen. Well, we'll be looking more into that key verse and the context surrounding that in a few moments' time. Before that, though, we're going to be looking at our second hymn. And... It's called The Battle is the Lord's. It's a tune that you'll be familiar with. Again, this was from the ABBA conference from Evangelical Movement of Wales. Um, but it's just a reminder that we are in this fight, but it's not our fight. It's God's fight. He has already won the victory. Um, but we're just continuing on these final skirmishes. And he is in complete control uh, of this fight. The battle is the Lord. So again, as the words come up, let's sing this together. Thank you, Nat. Kings chapter 18 and we're going to be looking particularly about the challenge on Mount Carmel so if you turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18 and we're going to read verses 20 to 40 And it says this. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left the prophets of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls. Let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first. For you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull, which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they leapt about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey. Or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until blood gushed on them. 
And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two sears of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the ball in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time, and they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time, and they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust. It licked up the water that was in the trench. When the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. And I'm just going to read the last couple of verses, in fact. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went to the top of Carmel. He bowed down on the ground, he put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. He went and looked and said, there is nothing. Seven times he said, go again. And it came to pass the seventh time, he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Amen. And just before we look at the word of God, let's ask for his blessing upon it. Let's ask him now to speak to us as we study this together. Let's pray. Our dear Father God, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for the freedom and the time that we have to read your word and to study it now. And we ask that you, by your spirit, would move in our hearts, that you would give us a head knowledge and an understanding of what is being said. But Lord, you would increase our faith and help us to believe and to act upon the word that we hear now. Meet with us in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was thinking as I was studying this last week uh, of a, a re relevant title. I still can't think of one. Essentially, we're going to be looking at prayer. The key verse, as I shared, was James 5 and the second half of verse 16. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So I suppose the title, if you're taking notes, would just be an effectual, fervent prayer life or um, just a life of prayer or something along those lines. But as we study this, I was thinking about the many things that are important to us in the Christian life. There's lots of things that we do as Christians, aren't there? Lots of things that we believe, lots of things that we say. And various denominations will focus on some of those things, some more on one thing and some less on another, etc. But, you know, when we really stop and think about it, we can probably count just on one hand uh, the most important things to us as, as a Christian. And two of those things that I'm going to be thinking about today Obviously, one of them, the main one is prayer. And the other one is reading God's word. And when we think about those two things going hand in hand, um, I just want to clarify what I mean by those. So when we read God's word, I don't just mean, oh, we've just had a read. You know, I've just picked up the Bible and just read a few 
verses. I'm talking about thoroughly immersing yourself in the word of God, learning from it and comprehending what it's saying and to applying it to your life. You think about what the Psalms go on quite a lot about meditating on the word of God. And then the other one is prayer as well. More than just the um, perhaps everyday prayers or those arrow prayers as we perhaps call them or dear Lord, please bless so-and-so. We're talking about truly understanding what prayer is, um, how and when to pray, what to pray for and having a life of prayer rather than just praying at times in our life. And these two things, um, perhaps like they're right at the very top of what's important to us as Christians. But the sad fact is, and we can perhaps agree with this maybe in our own lives, um, or perhaps um, with other Christian members that we know and things that struggle for these two things, that despite the fact that they're probably some of the most important things that we should have right at our core as Christians, sadly, they're quite often the most neglected, these two, aren't they? The most neglected are reading God's word and praying. And everything else that we do in our lives is actually a reflection of these two things. Think about our, our attendance, our involvement in the church community, our meetings and our outreach, our, our upkeep and welfare, etc. It's difficult at this moment because of the, the, the lockdown and the restrictions on physically meeting together. But generally as churches and as a community of Christians, um, how much and, and the time and the effort that we spend uh, and the sincerity we have in reading God's word and prayer affects the way that we commit to these things. Our personal evangelism as well, to our families, to neighbours, etc., to, to people at work. Our own hobbies and interests, are they coming before the things of God simply because we're ignorant uh, or just despising what God's word teaches, etc.? Satan will use anything to get in the way. Or even at work itself, what jobs are we doing and perhaps our, our career or, or the job that we have, how we conduct ourselves at that work, what we're willing to do, etc. Is that based on our knowledge of the scriptures? And uh, as we commit it to the Lord, do we commit our work to the Lord in prayer? So these things are directly affected by our attitude to God's word and prayer, aren't they? The way that we love our lives. And you can tell the maturity of a Christian and their attitude to these things after even a, only a short time with them. I'm still blown away every, every time I go on beach missions. It's been a few years now, but planning on going back again. Um, but just by the week spending just delved in, in the word of God in prayer and saturated in it and surrounded by a load of like-minded people. And it really shows the atmosphere is almost like a touch of heaven being on a week of beach mission or other mission things that you may have been involved in yourselves, holiday Bible clubs and, <clears throat> and things like that. And so I ask, what is your attitude? What is my attitude towards these things, to the reading of God's word and to prayer? And that key verse we read, well, it describes what prayer should be, shouldn't it? It should be effective and fervent from a righteous man or woman. But what does that mean? What does that mean as James writes that down? What makes prayer effective? What makes it fervent? What makes us righteous? Well, to be effective is to get answers or results, isn't it? That's from the dictionary definition. If we're fervent, then we're dedicated, passionate, and completely committed. And a righteous man or woman, simply, is someone who is obedient to the word of God and faithful to his, to the will of God, sorry. Obedient to the will of God and obedient to his word and faithful to his word. And there's many examples for us in the Bible, aren't there? Many examples of faithful men and women of God and examples of prayer. We think about the prayer of King Solomon, a great prayer of dedication of the temple. We think uh, of the very humble prayer. Lord, teach us to pray, say the disciples to Jesus. Or perhaps even the example that Jesus gave of the tax collector in the corner of the temple. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. All of these are great examples of real prayer. And I just want to share two examples of two people who we can use to perhaps help guide us in the way that we should conduct ourselves in prayer. And the first one is James's example that we just read off in James 5. He uses Elijah, doesn't he? He tells us of Elijah. He's a man of God. He's a man of faith. And he's a man of prayer. Verse 17, if you've got your Bibles at, at James 5, tells us that Elijah is a man like us, with like passions. He wasn't some super Christian or anything like that. But he prayed. James tells us his prayer was effective. We know that by what we've read in 1 Kings. And it was urgent. It was fervent. And it was... Um, pleasing to God and God honored his prayer. So what was Elijah's secret then? Well, there was nothing special about him as we've just thought of. He was a man with like passions as us. He had no superpowers that the Bible tells us about. He suffered hunger. You can read that in 1 Kings 17. 
during this time of drought and all that was going on for those three years. He was alone in his work, 1 Kings 18. We were reminded that he was alone as a prophet of Baal. Obadiah had hidden uh, prophets in the caves, but they weren't really being used, were they? They were just hiding in caves trying to survive. He was alone in his work. He was rejected and persecuted. 1 Kings 18, uh, 18 again. We read there. Um, sorry, I've just lost my place in the Bible. Uh, he answered, I'm not troubled as though you and your father's house have. And the fact that you have forsaken the commandments and the Lord and you have followed your bells. As Elijah is challenging Ahab, he sees that he's the only one in this work and he's being rejected and persecuted. The king calling him a troublemaker of the whole nation. Imagine being called the troublemaker of Great Britain, your public enemy number one. And he experienced fear. Only the chapter next in 1 Kings 19 as he flees for his life. So he's an ordinary human being, but he was a man of God. 1 Kings 17 verse 1 reminds us, it says, Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Abram, as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand. He's a man of God. He stood there representing God. And as we're going to look at now, he's a man of prayer. So let's look at this scenario around the main event of Elijah's ministry, which was Mount Carmel. His main objective was not to show off. It wasn't to perform some kind of Houdini uh, sleight of hand or trick or some kind of David Blaine magic. His task was quite simple. It was to bring the people back to God. And we're going to look at how he did that, how that was achieved. God had made a promise to the people of Israel years and years earlier. And we can read of that in Deuteronomy. If they walked with him, if they kept his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, there would be abundant blessing. And you can read that for yourselves in Deuteronomy chapter 28. If they turned from God and they rejected him and chased after the idols and the gods around, there would be a curse upon them. You read that further on in Deuteronomy 28. And one of the specific blessings that was mentioned is that of rain, the blessing of rain and land and animals. In Deuteronomy 28, 11 and 12, the Lord will grant you plenty of goods, the fruit of your body and the increase of your livestock, the produce of your ground, the land of which the Lord your God swore to your fathers to give you. And that is a reflection of the very first promise that God made to Abram, that threefold blessing of children, of land, and of blessing. He was a nation and he was given a land to be in and there would be blessing in, uh, in all of that. But then we also see the disobedience. Israel's disobedience would bring famine and hardship. The same chapter says, and your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze. The earth which is under you shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down until you are destroyed. These are very strong words, but God made it abundantly clear to them that if they walk with him and followed him, then there would be that blessing. If they turn from him, that God would deal with that and there would be judgment and curse upon them. So Israel wasn't ignorant of these things, but Israel was living in a period of sin. Sadly, we read of King Ahab throughout Kings, that he did more than more evil than any other king uh, before him. 1 Kings 16, we read more of that. You see the depravity of the nation. But in contrast to Ahab, the leader of the people, we stand Elijah, the man of God. The king should have been leading the people in the right way. But it was down to God's prophet, God's man, Elijah. And Elijah's very name is a challenge to Ahab. The Lord is my God is what Elijah means. And he brings God's message of judgment to the king. As we just read there, 1 Kings 17, verse 1, he says, as the Lord God of Israel lives. Elijah is coming faithfully in the name of God. And the challenge that Elijah brings is evidence of God's eternal power. From that time, there is no rain. James 5, 17, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain in the land for three years and six months. It wasn't the power of Elijah. It was actually just an enactment of God's promise already to the people. And Elijah was God's man to enact that promise. And, you know, the same still applies to us today. Obviously, we don't pray for rain and not in the same way, anything like that. But if we walk like the people of Israel did at this time, we may belong to God. We may be his, but that blessing is lost. And God, and I use this, seems distant and there is frustration instead of peace in our lives. We know that God is spirit. He cannot physically move nearer or away from us. But his breathless, his blessing can be withdrawn from us. And instead of 
those times that we face, those difficulties and stuff, and having peace in them. There's so often frustration because we're no longer in step, in phase with God and his will and his way. We're doing things our own way and there's no blessing in that. Well, we fast forward three years to 1 Kings 18, the passage. Came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, as God promised, saying, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. Now, everything we've seen so far and everything we're about to see is all according to the sovereign will of God. During this time, this three years, we've built up a very, very powerful contrast. We have Elijah, who during this time of drought is provided for by God. Read that in 1 Kings 17. He's been prepped and made ready for this challenge that's coming up. On the other hand, we see Ahab, who is desperate. He's the king. He's the ruler of the whole nation. He's got all the power to control all of these things. And yet he sends out his man Obadiah to desperately try and find the last remnants of water and of supplies for his people because he loves them, takes care of them. No, just for his animals. What a selfish king. What a godless king. Ahab's concern is only for himself. He rejected God. He's turned to idol worship. And I find the irony here is, is quite strong and amusing, really. The main idol that they were worshipping, Baal, was supposed to be the god of all of these things. He was supposed to be able to take care of the land and the crops and the rain and the harvest. And the very god who they're turning to, who was 100% for the task, was 100% fail. Useless. And it's at this breaking point that God sends his man to challenge the people and to look again at the heart of their faith and where it lies with its consequences and where it should be with its tremendous blessing. And the challenge is set. The challenge is in front of the entire nation. This isn't a local thing between Ahab and Elijah. The entire nation is invited and told to come along. And it's a test of fire. And that's interesting because this is not the first time that God has done this. If you read in Leviticus 9, again, feel free to do that at the end of the service. Moses and Aaron are blessing the people before the Lord. And God rains fire on the sacrifice there as well. And in 1 Kings 18, we read that Elijah comes to the people. And he lays the challenge before them quite simply. How long will you falter between the two options, etc.? The people, they haven't got an answer. Their faith is nowhere. They're not walking with the Lord. They've not been reading his word. They've not been living a life of prayer. They answered him not a word. And Elijah sets the challenge before them of the bulls. And you can read that in the passage before you. But put no fire under it, he says. There's no trickery going on here. You call on the name of your God. You say that Baal is a God. Pray to your God. Show how faithful you are to him. Show how um, uh, respectful uh, he is to your faith and, and your prayers and how he will honor that and answer you by fire. And I'll do the same thing to God. Notice he talks about your gods. And he says, I will call on the name of the God, the God, and the one who answers by fire. Well, the prophets of Baal go first. They call to their God and there's nothing. All the pomp and the ceremony behind their uh, their rituals and their prayers it increases still nothing interesting you think about what jesus preaches on doesn't he in the sermon on the mount about there is no need for pomp and ceremony before him god knows what you need before you ask it and here they are dancing around flailing and doing all this stuff no answer violence and self-sacrifice become the next step up they're up in their game the ante has been increased it's very dramatic it's very painful and it's in complete contrast to god's way isn't it God tells us to come before him quietly and humbly and respectfully. And yet here they are dancing and shouting and cutting themselves, abusing their bodies. Nothing. Then it's Elijah's turn. There's no pomp or ceremony here, is there? There's no shouting. Nobody gets stabbed. Nobody gets cut or injured. At the appointed time, reading verse 29 there and verse 36, Elijah begins to prepare. He uses the appointed place. Look at verse 30, 32. And he rebuilds the broken down altar. There's great symbolism there as well, isn't there? And he presents his sacrifice, verse 33. And he then prays. Everything that Elijah does is God's way. And Elijah's learned that from God's word. God's word tells us how we should worship him and how we come before him. And everything that God, that Elijah is doing is a demonstration of that. Elijah knows the word of God 
and he is working here in obedience to the word of God. He's coming at the appointed time. He's coming to the appointed place. He repairs the appointed altar and he then prays in God's way. It says there in the verses, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. He came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel. And notice here the wording. It's not about Elijah. It's about God. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. I am your servant, that I've done these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, that you have turned their hearts back to you again. It's not about Elijah. It's about God. The focus is on God, his will, his way. And God accepts the sacrifice, verse 38. Elijah's prayer is answered and the fire rains down from heaven. What a sight! Think about that for a moment. I still can't get my head around that. I mean, I've seen explosions and things like that. It's misuse of the job I'm in. But um, to see fire physically rain down from heaven, I mean, what an awesome sight that must have been. It burnt up everything. It burnt up the stones and the wood and the sacrifice. It burnt up the water. There was no possible way there was a cheat on this. And you know what? I can't possibly be the only person excited by even just a vision of this, because look what the people, they can't help but acknowledge God. Verse 39, when the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. They couldn't deny it. The people are turning back to God and the blessing will now return to the people. The prophets of Baal, note, are executed. And Elijah has one final task here. Verse 41, Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the abundance of rain. The skies are still currently like they are out my window right now. Completely blue, cloudless. And yet he's saying to Ahab confidently, there is the sound of the abundance of rain. That's amazing. Elijah, what a man of faith. He knows it's going to happen. The people have turned back to God and he knows that God is faithful to keep his promises. Sound of heavy rain. Elijah prays for the rains to return in verse 42. He prays seven times. Everything Elijah has done has been according to the will of the, of the Lord. And God once again honors the prayer or the prayers of Elijah. The rain comes small at first, but then in abundance, like a massive thunderstorm. It came to pass the seventh time. There's a cloud as small as a man's hand, says the man. It's just, it's just tiny. It's nothing, Elijah. But Elijah says, no, go and tell Ahab to get ready. Because, you know, he's going to struggle to get back in the wet. What faith. Now, what makes Elijah a good example for us here? It's quite simple, really. He was obedient to the will of God, to the word of God, and he was prayerful. He was always ready to go where God would send him. You can see that in 1 Kings 18 and then in 19 as well, after he's fleed and God brings him back. He's willing to pray whenever prayer was needed. You see that in 1 Kings 17 and where we just read now. And he was also willing to confront evil whenever confrontation was necessary, not unnecessarily, but when it was necessary. And ultimately, he was confident in God to look after him. Mostly. Elijah wasn't perfect, though. He did make mistakes, didn't he? And when he took his eyes off God, you read at the beginning of 1 Kings 19, and he looked at the storm around him, as it were, uh, i.e. Jezebel's threat. But we are reminded, as James tells us, James 5, 17, he was a man with a nature like ours, a flawed nature. Elijah wasn't a super Christian. He was a person who had like passions as we, and he still struggled with things in life as well. So while he's a great example, he's not a perfect one. But I wouldn't be faithful in my preaching if I didn't point you today to Jesus Christ. And so funnily enough, unsurprisingly, my second example, my, my only other example is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, Jesus is the perfect example. You get no Sunday school points this morning for, uh, for agreeing with me on that. But let's look at why. And rather than preach on this, I've simply just brought all the verses that I could bring to mind of Jesus Christ and his life of prayer and the word. First, when Jesus prayed, Mark 1.35. Now, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. A great while before day, Jesus knew that he had to be in a time of prayer with the Lord. Luke 6, 12, it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night, all night in prayer 
to God. And we also read in Matthew 14, 23, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went on to the mountain by himself to pray. And then when evening has come, he was alone there. You know, and they're just three verses, morning, noon, and night, sometimes all night, a great while before day. Jesus Christ knew how important it was to be in prayer. Second, where Jesus prayed. We know that he prayed in front of crowds with the various things that he did with his ministry. He prayed in, in front of and with his disciples. But often Jesus prayed alone. Luke 11, verse 1. When uh, it came to pass, he was praying in a certain place. Luke 9, 18. It happened when he was alone praying. His disciples then joined him. Luke 5, 16. So he himself often withdrew, often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Mark 6, 46. When he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. And I just love it reading those verses because there's no distractions. There's no telephone calls or TV going or Internet running or anything like that. He withdrew from those things, things that in and of themselves aren't bad things. Sometimes he was praying these examples or after he just fed the 5000, etc. But Jesus knew the importance of what prayer really is. And it's not just a quick thing with other things drifting in and out on your mind. It's being alone with God. And completely dedicating that time to the Lord in prayer and speaking to him. So third, how and what Jesus prayed. Well, we know that he thanked God for the food. John 6, 11, he took the loaves and when he'd given thanks, he distributed them. Obviously, the feeding of 5,000, he did that with the other miracles as well. We know that he prayed for healing at times. We think about when Jesus prayed in John 11, he took away the stone from the place and Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. A great prayer of faith as he then raised Lazarus from the dead. He prayed for his disciples, Luke 22, 32. I have prayed for you, says Jesus, that your faith should not fail. Jesus knew their hearts. He knew how frail they were, how easy it was for them to run away and to give up. I have prayed for you, says Jesus. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. He prays for the church. John 17, 9. I pray for them, says Jesus, in the great high priestly prayer of John 17. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. That's us. Brothers and sisters, that's me and you. We belong to him and he prays for us. That's amazing. And he continues to pray for us. Romans 8, 34, what a passage. Who is he who condemns? Well, it doesn't matter, does it? Because it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. We don't serve a dead hero. We serve a risen savior. Amen. Who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us? He is there right now pleading on our behalf. I haven't half the time got a clue what I should pray for. But I am reassured by the fact that Jesus is sitting there having conquered my sin. And he is bringing my needs before the God, before the Father, before my Father. How amazing. Jesus was always in prayer. He taught prayer. Think about the Lord's Prayer when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he lived his prayers. What do I mean by that? He acted in accordance with a prayer. He didn't just pray one thing and then go and do another. He didn't sort of commit something to the Lord and then try to figure out how to do it himself in his own strength. He gave it to the Lord and then he acted in accordance with that. He left it in the hands of the Father who always judges rightly. So let's finish off by comparing these two then. Elijah and Jesus share some very deep similarities regarding their prayer life. Both faced incredible opposition from their own people. How bad is that? People who should have been on side. King Ahab for Elijah and the Pharisees for Jesus. Both held nothing back in prayer. It wasn't just a short, sharp, oh, dear Lord, please quickly bless so-and-so, etc. Really laying hold of the Lord in prayer. Think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Earnestly prayed, passionately praying. And both were found in prayer in the darkest part of their lives. I.e. when his life was threatened, Elijah, and then in the Garden of Gethsemane. But there is also found the difference as well. Like I said, Elijah isn't a perfect example. He's a good one. 
But here's kind of the difference. Elijah, at the lowest part of his life, in 1 Kings 19, he prayed inwardly, didn't he? He made that mistake. He's human like us. He prayed inwardly. His own desire was that he would die. 1 Kings 19, 4. Came and sat under a broom tree. He prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my father's. You know, we've all experienced those real low times in our lives as well. But thank God that sometimes when we pray amiss, when we're praying selfishly or wrongly, that God unsurprisingly says no. And God said that to Elijah, didn't he? He said, no, no, fella. I've got more for you to do. I'm still going to do great things through you. Instead, what did God do? He strengthened Elijah, didn't he? The angel came and had the food before him. He strengthened him for what was to come. Jesus, in contrast, at his lowest point in Gethsemane, he prayed outwardly. He desired God's will. I'm sorry, I can't say this without crying. He prayed that God's will would happen no matter what the cost. He said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. He knew exactly what he was about to face for you and I. The physical anguish, the pain to his body. But far more than that, he knew because he is God that the father was about to turn his back on the son. And yet he could still look to heaven and cry, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What an example. Why do we need to create and maintain an effectual fervent prayer life like that of the Lord Jesus? Well, as with Elijah and Christ, our enemy is ever present and he's unrelenting. And he has one desire. Peter reminds us of that. It's to simply tear us apart. Tear you limb from limb like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And as with both, we are often weak as well, aren't we? Think about what we're going through at the moment. And it may be that you're really struggling physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually, or all of the above. And we need him to be strong. Ephesians 6 reminds us, I preached on this to you not too long ago. And Paul says, finally, my brother, be strong in ourselves. No, in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ultimately, we will fail without this in our lives. So I'll finish with this. We, we need to know God's word. We need to really know God's word. And that's a sermon for another day. Because to know God's word helps us to know God's will. And when we know God's will, our prayers are then most effective when we pray in line with God's will. Those things build one another up. And so God's word must go hand in hand with our prayer life. So we need to approach both these things. And obviously we've looked at prayer this morning. We need to approach both these things with the passion and the boldness of Elijah, but also with the mind, the heart and the dedication of Jesus Christ. And if we do, we can't go too far wrong, can we? Well, let's, let's pray now, shall we? Let's ask God to help us to think about these words as we finish our time before closing in our final hymn. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit who gives us understanding of your word. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh, that the triune God is working in our lives every single day. Lord, we pray that you would give us a renewed passion for your word and for a life of prayer, that you would give us a hunger and a thirst for your word and for righteousness, that we may be filled. And Lord, would you help us to know what to pray? Lord, to guide our prayer lives, that if we're lacking wisdom, that we would ask of you, that as James again reminds us at the beginning of his letter, that we would not ask with doubts in our minds, because then we will just be driven and tossed by like a wave of the sea by the wind. Lord, may we really learn to mature in our prayer life and our walk with you and to really lay hold of you, to claim those promises of God, to say that they are yes and amen in our lives. And may other people look at our lives and see not us, but you living within us and working out your purposes and your sovereign will within us and that you would use us for great things. Lord, I thank you for this time sharing with my brothers and sisters at Market Overton. 
and I pray that you would continue to bless them as we go from this place, enjoying this day of rest and the future worship this afternoon and all that lies ahead in this week. Lord God, would you prepare us and strengthen us for these things? We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to close in our final hymn, again from the Evangelical Movement of Wales, from the ABBA conference last year. And the song is, There is a hope that burns within my heart. And again, as we see these words, may they apply to us, that we don't have a false hope. It's not like the prophets of Baal dancing and singing around and stabbing themselves. It's a real hope in God, that we can trust in him, rely upon him, and know that he will hear us, and he will answer us, and he will take care of us. Let's sing this song together. Thank you.